Psalm 2, ladies and gentlemen. Psalm 2 says this, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Now, what's this about? They weren't quite prepared for the Messiah that Jesus represented. They imagined a political solution. They preferred freedom from Roman oppression. By the time Jesus arrived, the Romans were the overlords of the land, which was humiliating for the people. They were subjugated to the Roman soldiers, to Roman authority. They paid excessive taxes. They endured abusive treatment. They were not equal before the law. And therefore, their imagination was Messiah when he came would remove the political restraints. It really seems to me that this is talking about how the nations around the world are in rebellion against God. Jesus' message was directed at the behavior of the covenant people of God. They wanted someone to talk to the Romans. And he talked to them. He said, you're not reading the scriptures right. You have much religious activity and lots of religious language and you have religious rules for what to eat and when to worship and how to worship, but your hearts are far from God. And we see that in our government now. We see that in human governments all over the world. We as people don't want to follow the Lord. We want to throw off what we perceive to be God's chains and throw off God's shackles But the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. So I would submit to you that Jesus' words to his audience in the Gospel of Luke are very relevant to those of us in the 21st century. We have lived with great freedom and great liberty and great abundance and great opportunities to worship God, to gather in our churches, to read our Bibles. And I think in some very similar ways, we have drifted. And if we're to take the words of the Gospel of Luke seriously at all, I would submit to you that we're in, we are confronted with almost identical choices to the audience that Jesus addressed. That if we don't engage God in a more meaningful way with humility and repentance and seek him, I think we will face the interruption of our life patterns. Are the nations raging against the Lord our God? We'll talk about that today on our program. I'm Ken Michael. Joining me is Pastor Josh Schwartz, and we have a special guest with us today, Lee Brainerd from Soothkeep Ministries. Lee, thanks for joining us. Well, Ken, it's a pleasure to be with you and Josh. It's always a pleasure to be here in all of Tree Ministries, and we have a lot to talk about today. Yes, we do. I'm looking forward to it. Well, before we dive into the video that we saw, tell us a little bit about your ministry. Well, I specialize in uh, biblical languages and eschatology. Uh, It's been my favorite subject for over four decades. Yeah, and you do a great job. We're thankful for all the work that you put in. Yeah, and if you haven't checked out his videos, I would. uh, How can they find your videos? Are they on social media? They're on the Soothkeep on YouTube and on Rumble, and they also have can check out my website Soothkeep.info. Sounds good. Well, we have a number of elections coming up all over the world, but in particular right here in the United States. And even though we don't know the outcome yet, um, what should we expect? No matter who gets elected, um, we know that God is in control. And I think too many people put the emphasis on who our elected officials are versus what we should be doing as followers of Jesus Christ and what we should be focusing on. And I know you did a a series of videos recently on the 10 kingdoms, which was phenomenal. Yeah, I think the election cycle here is more challenging to the Bible believing voter than we've ever seen in the past decades. The lines of demarcation between Republican and Democrat is less pronounced than it has been in the past, even though superficially it looks like the far left is more Marxist than ever. And yet on the right side of the aisle, we see the Republican position becoming more of an independent Mm -hmm. position. And it, it leaves a lot of Christians in a conundrum. Who should they be voting for? I just want to encourage people, vote for freedom, folks. If you can't get your, uh, T's crossed and your I's dotted with your candidate on all your favorite check marks, 
boxes to check mark, just vote for freedom. Who's going to give you the most freedom in the next four years? Amen. I think that's a great perspective because after all, um, <laughs> that's really a, a demarking line. If you look, like you said, Lee, uh, at the uh, left, uh, they are more aligning with the Marxist ideals than ever before in history. And it's just checkbox after checkbox. So voting for freedom is a great idea. Amen. And no matter who, like I said, no matter who wins the election, we're seeing the setup for global government. And like I said, you talked about these. People are always asking, is this the, the are we seeing the setup for the 10 kingdoms? I, I absolutely do. We're seeing uh, great rearrangements in Europe in their military and economic policies. We're seeing some great changes in uh, their uh, interactions with the Middle East and their interactions with America. And we look at what's coming down the pike and is America going to weaken and, and be part of this coalition? Are we going to weaken and just kind of fall to the wayside? Well, the future is going to let us know. But the one thing is absolutely certain is that the Europe is rising to be a dominant force in the Middle East. Absolutely. And it's it's interesting, the very opening video, we were talking about Psalm 2. And yes. Psalm 2, it, it, it's a theme throughout history that the nations are continually raging against God. There is the, the nations that are led by the evil one and the nations that are trying to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And we That's know right. that the ultimate outcome for any nation that isn't submitting themselves to Jesus is going to be utter destruction, uh, as we, we see that um, Psalm 2 tells us that you shall break them. This is a messianic psalm. This is uh, the command of God to Jesus the Son. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. We know the outcome of uh, evil nations is going to be destruction. But e even in the here and now, are we seeing nations rage all around the world? Oh, absolutely. To me, it's shocking to look at the change in the political perspectives and the moral perspectives since I was a child to the present day. We're seeing uh, not only the rise of the LGBTQ movement and, and the rise of far-left Marxism and their policies so that we've seen Marxism switch from the old-fashioned Soviet-style Marxism or Chinese Marxism to this new modern New World Order version of Marxism, which is, I think, 10 times worse than anything we've ever seen before. And we see opposition to God-ordained institutions, the institution of marriage, the institution of the distinction of the sexes, the institution of meat, the institution of dairy, the institution of, of the home, the institution of the parents being a fundamental part of the child's education. This is being destroyed. Yeah, systematically, piece by piece, destroyed. Why? Because the evil one does not want God to be honored or glorified. The evil one wants to glorify himself and build up his kingdom, and that's that's exactly what he's doing. The fourth beast kingdom is rising. That's exactly right. And we know that this is all going to culminate eventually around the nation of Israel. And we're seeing the nations rising and not only raging against God, but they're coming against Israel. So does this, are we seeing the setup or the lead up to Ezekiel 38? Oh, absolutely. And I like the point you just made, Ken, about putting Israel in this piece as, as one of the indications that we're in the last days, because the rise in anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and anti-Israel in the last year is in my mind the single greatest phenomenon that we are seeing that shouts to everyone with their eyes open and their ears open that we are in the last days. Yeah, it's almost as though the neon sign was turned on in 1948 and now it's flashing since October 7th. That's that's a good an analogy. <clears throat> so then does Psalm 83, there's a lot of controversy around that. Has it already happened? Uh, are we witnessing a lead up to that, or is it going to happen in the future? What's your take on Psalm 83? Well, in my mind, Psalm 83 isn't giving us a snippet that's going to cover like six months or a year and a half of history at the end of the age. I think we're seeing in this passage uh, the historic enemies of Israel that have constantly been a thorn in our flesh. This is going to come to a head in the last days, and I think it's going to come to a head in association with Ezekiel 38 and 39. And whether that's going to piggyback with each other, one or the other, 
or whether they're going to just coalesce together with two different motivations working for one massive invasion. This is going to be brought to a head in the last days. Now, that's a great point, because what, what we're seeing is all of Scripture moving us towards this ultimate climax of the tribulation period, where yep. God begins to work with Israel primarily again. And you've got all of Israel's neighbors and those that aren't part of, say, the the Western or Eastern Roman Empire yeah. coming together with a desire to bring a destruction on God's chosen people. Absolutely. And what's interesting to me is this: these northern hordes have been a thorn in, in the flesh of the four empires of the times of the Gentiles from the very beginning. Those northern hordes, the Scythians and the Scandinavians and the Germans and, and the Gauls, which are the, the ancient Franks or the French, they invaded Europe and the Middle East over and over again against Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. They sacked Rome five times. Mm. They resulted in the collapse of the western half of the Roman Empire. This is rising up again in the last days in bricks. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. It is rising up in the last days again in bricks. Now, can you have a video that you want to show that kind of tells us what bricks has been doing the last couple of weeks? Yeah, let's take a look at that and then we'll talk about it. It's the largest gathering of world leaders in Russia in decades. The countries attending, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, among others, are united by a desire to reduce dependence on Western-led institutions of global governance and finance. It's why one of the top items on the agenda at this year's summit is reducing dependence on the U.S. dollar. The whole reason the BRICS uh, nations have come together is to pull the United States out of their position of power. Multiple dictatorships who oppose the United States and the West are also lining up to join the BRICS group. Many other countries, maybe 28, are partner states or have applied to join. You've got nations that are afraid of America that are coming together right now trying to, to um, break America's military and economic dominance. But this is an alliance of fear. It's not necessarily an alliance of, of uh, any strong foundation of unity. The three-day BRIC summit, which started Tuesday in the southwestern uh, city, Russian city of Kazan, is the first meeting of the group of major emerging economies. Um, um, Putin met with China's Xi Jinping uh, at the summit on Tuesday and claimed afterwards their country's partnership was a model of how a relationship between states should be built. We're going to take all that the scripture says on the subject. We're going to take it at face value. We're going to trust it implicitly with childlike faith. So, Lee, we're seeing nations coming together. Most of them are totalitarian, and they're trying to break mostly the United States economic system. They want to get rid of the dollar as the standard for, for currency. But a lot of these nations that we saw in there, some of them are going to be involved in Ezekiel 38. They're not going to be around after God defeats them. But up until that, we're seeing the lead up to that. What's your take on this BRICS nations coming together and what's their main purpose? Well, I think it's what the point that we were just talking about, these northern horde nations that are not subject to God, and they're not, you know, God gave the control of the Middle East to the four empires of the times of the Gentiles, and they have continually tried to exalt themselves against that. I think we saw the same spirit with Nazi Germany trying to dominate the Middle East and in Europe. We saw it with the Soviet Union trying to dominate Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. Now we see BRICS rising up again. Over and over again, God's worked mysteriously in the background to preserve the domination of the four empires of the times of the Gentiles. Since, uh, well, since the rise of the Roman Empire, of course, we're in the, the Roman Empire. Now we see the fractured Roman Empire today. I personally am convinced that the fractured Roman Empire is going to rise to dominance in the last days, that this BRICS effort is going to largely fail. Now, the technology and the, and the interest that they're stirring towards a one-world system is probably going to be absorbed into the Roman Empire and used. But you're right, Ken, most of those nations in this BRICS, they are going to be crushed in the Ezekiel 38 and 39 thing, and the ones that are left, are well, they're going to be isolated. 
the South American nations, China, they're going to be doing their own thing. That's fascinating because in that clip, uh, we, we had you in there saying, we're going to stick to what the word of the Lord says, yeah. because it's a great roadmap because it's trustworthy. Uh, prophecy has been defined as history written in advance. That's and right. that's, that's really what it is. So it, it's fascinating to see that you, you will have a rise uh, of these nations in the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. And to your point there, it's the, the Northern hordes. It's not the 10 kingdoms as mentioned in the book of Revelation. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, there's a lot of people on YouTube channels teaching that the BRICS nations are going to end up being the Antichrist conglomeration and the 10 kings of the last days. And superficially, you can see where they get there. They're just excited. This is what we would call newspaper exegesis. Mm -hmm. You're getting too much current events and not enough understanding of the Bible and its breadth and depth. And you're straying from the historical grammatical hermeneutic. But if you're going to go down that path, you have the nations of the Ezekiel 38 and 39 coalition well-defined. And we know that they are not going to be part of the Roman coalition. Those right. were nations. Most of them were never part of the Roman Empire. And a few of them, like Persia, will be reabsorbed back into the Roman Empire if the Lord so wills. But they, Persia was never strictly part of the Roman Empire. Right. That's fascinating. And, and, and friends, where we're pulling all of this from is the book of Daniel, chapter 7, and the book of Revelation. Let me read just really quickly about that fourth beast kingdom yep. from the book of Daniel. Uh, let's begin in uh, Daniel 7 and 7. Now, this is what Daniel writes. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. I considered these horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little horn, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by its roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. And we know that these... Ten horns represent ten kingdoms That's of right. the last days, and that little horn that rose up in the midst of them, we, we know that uh, really that is the Antichrist pushing his agenda. Right. And so what we have to understand is there is a distinction, as Lee just made, between the Gog-Magog nations and coalition, if you will, and the revived Roman Empire and the ten kingdoms with the little horn rising up from the midst. They are two separate entities, all with the same desire to destroy Israel, to destroy God's chosen people, and to destroy, if you will, uh, in modern terms, Western Judeo-Christian values, but there is still a distinction between the two. That's exactly right. And when the dust settles from Ezekiel 38 and 39, those nations are going to be removed from the picture as a threat to the Roman Empire in the last days. The, the Islamic fundamentalist threat's gone, and the Russian juggernaut threat is gone. Wow. Ken, what are your thoughts? Well, the, if you look at it, the nations, the mostly the BRICS nations, are already totalitarian governments. Yeah. So they're not going to join in with the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, like the European and Western nations that you talked about. So they're already, they, they don't want to be told what to do. Right. So we're seeing BRICS almost going against what the New World Order, or One World Government is, is being put together for. That's how I see it. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's it's the globalists versus the anti-globalists, but they're all still enemies of God. Yes, that's exactly right. Exactly mm -hmm. right. And folks, this seems real omnibus. I know it seems, uh, you know, there's so much going on right now, but we want to end with some encouragement. And Josh, I know you had a verse you wanted to share. Yeah, absolutely. And, and before I get to the verse, I think it's important to recognize all of this is pointing us on the trajectory of the last days. These things are all culminating, as God had promised they would, with the ultimate fulfillment uh, of of the earthly reign of Jesus Christ during the millennial kingdom, and and His people gathered around Him, worshiping for literally those thousand years with the physical, visible Jesus ascended on the throne there in the in Jerusalem, literally. So we, we are looking forward to all these things, but we know that there's death, there's destruction, there's hardship, there's suffering, there's all kinds of brokenness that takes place. 
but Jesus is our hope. And I think it's really important uh, in all things in the New Testament, Paul comes back to an encouragement. And here in Romans chapter 13, he, he concludes this whole chapter by saying this, Romans 13, beginning in verse 11, he says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Friends, every day that goes forward is a day closer to that uh, ultimate time with Jesus in eternity, but even before that, literally on earth, worshiping him. So we're getting nearer and nearer, and we must wake up. We must stay awake, uh, be woke scripturally, if you will. And then he says this, verse 12, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Friends, we have our hope set on Jesus. He is our blessed hope. We know that he will come and rapture us. But until then, we flee immorality, we flee wickedness, we flee idolatry, and we cling to Jesus. We look to Jesus. We live righteously in a dark, dark world. Absolutely. Amen. Well, I want to thank our special guest, Lee Brainerd. Lee, before we close real quick, how can people get a hold of you? Well, they can contact me through soothkeep.info, which is my website, or they can connect with me via my YouTube channel, Soothkeep, or on Twitter, or on Instagram. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us. And folks, uh, no matter what happens in the election, if the person uh, that you elected didn't get in or did, remember one thing. We don't put our faith and trust in politicians. We put them in Almighty God. God is on the throne. His son Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's interceding for us right now. So until then, keep looking up, for your redemption draws near. <laughs>